Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast. Today's Thursday, August 6, 2020. In today's podcast, the postpartum visit, Dr. Stephanie Lamb and I discuss the office visit that is usually scheduled six to eight weeks after delivery. We discuss what to expect, what the goals of the visit are, and what kind of things we usually address. This is the second podcast in our short mini series on the fourth trimester, with the first podcast on recovery from vaginal and cesarean delivery dropping earlier this week. Next week, we will be pivoting to the other bookend of pregnancy, the time prior to pregnancy, with a mini series on fertility. So look forward to some really interesting podcasts on that fascinating topic starting next week. Thanks for listening. Have a great day and a great weekend. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. We're here with Dr. Stephanie Lamb, podcast sensation from her prior podcast on Healthful Woman, and there was just so much clamoring to bring her back. We decided to have you back on, which is a no-brainer. You're the best. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm excited. Fantastic. So we're going to be talking today about the postpartum visit. And so just for our listeners to understand, what, what exactly is the postpartum visit? So I actually heard someone mention the phrase, the fourth trimester, I don't know, several years ago. And it was like the best little phrase that I had heard because we talk about in pregnancy, you know, your first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, and then there becomes this forgotten period afterwards until you come for a checkup after you deliver your baby. And we refer to that as your postpartum visit, which is the time after you have a baby. And usually it could be anywhere between three weeks after delivery up to 12 weeks, we say. But that time period after we refer to as the fourth trimester. And that's really the time where moms start to recover, babies start to develop, and it's this beautiful interplay between the two. And it's a, it's a hard time period. Right. A lot happens in the fourth trimester. I think a lot happens. Yeah, absolutely. So as you said, it, it can range from when it is. I would say on average, probably people come at around six-ish weeks. Yeah, I think we try, to, we try to tailor it for each individual patient, depending upon if there were any high-risk issues in the pregnancy, if you had any difficulties in the in the delivery. But in general, on average, it's about six weeks that we see in for your visit. Right. And I think that sort of came to be because most women after both a vaginal delivery and a C-section are usually, if not 100% recovered by six weeks physically, they're almost there, even for a C-section. Vaginal delivery obviously tends to be earlier. And so for C-sections, women used to come in earlier, like they would come in twice, like at two weeks. And then again, at six weeks, two weeks was sort of just to look at the incision. incision. Yeah. But then we realized we were making all these postpartum women who had operations or in pain and have newborns come into our office. So we can look at them and say, you look good. Right. Go it's home. hard, it's hard yeah. enough to make <laughs> breakfast in the morning. Forget about right. like getting yourself together to come in for a visit. But when I first started, we brought everybody in at about two weeks. We would look at their incision, check a blood pressure, make sure they look fine. And then we'd bring them back again uh, like one month after that. Mm-hmm. If the delivery looks good and you don't really have any risk factors, we try to just let everyone kind of hang at home for that six week period, knowing full well that they can call us at any point if they have any issues. But six weeks, we bring them back to take a peek at them. Right. Some of that is related to access of care, meaning for you know, a practice where it's pretty easy for a patient to call up at, let's say, you know, one or two weeks after delivery and say, hey, I'm having this problem with this problem. Let's say, yeah, come in today, come in tomorrow. All right. And then it's pretty straightforward. But a lot of places that's just difficult to do logistically. And so they would routinely just schedule everybody for one or two weeks out just to make sure they have a chance to come in and see somebody. So I guess it depends on exactly the type of practice you're in. And essentially, there's a several goals of the postpartum visits that I wanted to go over with you in in no particular order. But I think the first thing sometimes is just like a debrief of the delivery and the pregnancy. What happened? Because a lot sometimes happens during pregnancy, during delivery, and it's a very crazy time and everyone's busy. And a lot of, you know, women, a lot of families don't have time to process and they just have questions. You know, what happened? What was this? You know, what did you give me? And sort of, you know, to have a chance to just sit down and discuss it. Have you found that that's something that comes up a lot at the postpartum visits or is it more rare? No, I I think the postpartum visit is actually a a bigger visit than 
when I first started, I realized that it was going to be. And I think it's a time period that you actually are looking back at the pregnancy. You're looking back at the delivery, just like you said. So it's like this pause to kind of go over how did the delivery go? Did you have any questions about how it went? And then you kind of look at the moment where you are now. How are you feeling? What's going on with you physically, emotionally? And then kind of looking forward, what could we do for you in the future to either not get you pregnant too quickly, talk about birth control, talk about medical issues we need to kind of talk about in the future. So it's really that that visit where you kind of look back, you take a pause, you look at the present, and then you look forward. I think it's a great way to think about it. And looking back, sometimes the things people want to discuss is they don't exactly remember mm-hmm. some of the things like, hey, like, did you give me medicine because I was bleeding or did you not? Or what exactly, you know, if let's say we did a forceps or a vacuum, like why did that happen? Did that and, happen? Sort of, and sometimes that go we discuss that on the on the postpartum rounds, like when the when someone's still in the hospital after delivery. But again And even then I don't even think they yeah, process it. So yeah, it's very hard. Many times birth is straightforward. You know, you come on in and if you're lucky enough, you have a simple vaginal delivery, you go home within a couple of days, most of the questions are answered and the patients are pretty happy and then they kind of understand what happens. If things and, you know, get a little bit trickier, either they need to be induced or it's a long process, they have this, they have a C-section or if they had a vacuum or a forceps delivery, there are probably questions that they just didn't quite get to think about at that time or, you know, things that were discussed that they want to retouch on. And I think the postpartum period, for sure, usually when I see the patients, I ask them how they're doing, if they have any questions about the delivery. And if I wasn't the person who got to deliver them, and I knew it was something a little outside the ordinary that I usually reach out to the doc to kind of go over it. And that way I can make arrangements to discuss it with them when they come in. Right. In one of our earlier podcasts with um, Liz Schlansky, she was talking about a lot of times women who end up with a C-section in labor, meaning their plan was to deliver vaginally. And for whatever reason, it switched and they had a C-section in labor. A lot of them wound up having many questions about many. that. Was it necessary? Maybe they feel regret. Maybe they feel some sort of failure of some sort. You know, a lot of, you know, people feel a lot of different things. And it's a great time to go over that and sort of reevaluate why did that happen? What were the reasons? You know, is it going to happen again? And just gives a, uh, an opportunity for people to talk and an- have their questions answered and maybe have closure on the delivery uh, if there was open issues. Right. I think there is more clarity when you take a breather and the the forest through the trees and the perspective of looking at this healthy baby at six weeks gives you some perspective of where your emotions may have been a little raw at the time of a delivery. Let's say you were really motivated for this vaginal delivery and your experience led you to a C-section for lots of different reasons. And I think the patients always, when they're recovering and they're exhausted from that long process of uh, trying for a vaginal delivery and their C-section may have been not what they wanted they're very emotional and appropriately so. They 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 thought this was going to go in a different direction. But when you get to them at six weeks and they have time to really appreciate this beautiful baby and realize that they're healthy, and the goal for all of us is just having a healthy baby and a healthy mommy, then their questions may be a little different than if they ask them the same questions on day one or two after delivery. So I think the postpartum period or that visit is a really useful visit to retouch on the delivery process. Right. I think something you mentioned is also so important that At the postpartum visit, it's really the first time we get to see the baby. So either moms come in with their baby. Sometimes that's just logistically, it works out best for them. You know, they're nursing, they'll have a babysitter, or they come and bring in photos of the baby. And for us, it's a great chance to like remind us sometimes of the fruits of our labors, you know, because we, we, you know, deliver women and newborns and then we don't see them again for several months weeks or months. And then when they come back, it's just amazing. I mean, the continuity when, when we, when we're lucky enough to go into this field, right. We sometimes see patients before they're pregnant, we see them while they're pregnant. And then afterwards you see this family unit. And a lot of times even the husbands are coming in or significant others or partners, whatever their special person is, but to see this baby coming at the six week visit. And if they don't bring the baby, usually one of us is always asking, even before we see them, like, okay, we have to see a picture of the baby. Like how is the baby doing? And so it does kind of become this we're invested in them. We want to see how this baby is doing and the mom. And I think that postpartum visit is exciting for us if they get to bring the kid, the right. little kitty in. Pre-corona, when we were allowed <laughs> to see other human beings, I mean, we would always in our office have babies. Babies. In there. I mean, it's, it's you know, adults. And someone volunteering in. to hold yeah. the baby you know, yeah. during the exam. Doctors, nurses. Yeah, Can I walking take the around? baby, walk yeah. around, pushing the, the stroller around? Because the mom actually, sometimes if they're not lucky enough, and many times there's nobody to help the mom at home, it's 
sometimes significant others go back to work, they're with the baby, they're excited to have someone take this baby off their hands even for 20 minutes. So everyone's clamoring to like take a peek at this baby. Right. And on and on the flip side, when rarely and unfortunately things don't go well at the delivery and the baby's not doing well, Correct. the baby's sick, the baby's in the NICU, or maybe it was a stillbirth, unfortunately, it also gives us a time to spend FaceTime with you know the family in grief and in support where before again it's in the hospital immediately afterwards and subsequently maybe over the phone or this but to see them and to talk to them is also very meaningful even for people who didn't have expected or a good outcome just to have that opportunity to you know to go over everything and obviously they would have more questions and more concerns sure. in the future and to have an opportunity to talk face to face is so critical just from an emotional standpoint and that sense of healing uh, yeah, I think beginning those, of healing maybe. those patients and when bad things happen, those are obviously the, the 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 absolute worst part of our jobs, obviously, as physicians. We're never really just waiting for that six week, six week visit. We're always reaching yeah. out a little bit after as soon as they leave the hospital. And then we're always trying to make a plan at that postpartum visit. Okay, what exactly happened? Let's set you up either with a preconception if you're thinking about getting pregnant again in the future. How can this not happen again in the future? And then tucking them in because I think the one thing that we don't do well enough, I think, in this country, and we try, we talk about the pregnancy and, and all the good things in pregnancy, but the downfalls and the risks of postpartum depression and anxiety. And I think that's such a huge part of. Uh, listen, as as a mom, as someone who's had two kids, I can definitely see the roller coaster of emotions and how you feel over the six, week, six weeks. So most, and I think a lot of the reason why we bring the patients in is I want to see them. I want to see how do they feel? Are they happy? Are they sad? And up to 20% of women can have postpartum depression and the blues. So especially if you suffer with a difficult outcome, such as a stillbirth or a prolonged stay in the NICU, these moms who have babies who stay in the NICU for a period of time, they're really a setup for postpartum depression. So we want to get them tucked in with somebody you know that they're doing okay. Right. And I think that's been one of the great achievements, I would say, in our field over the past probably 10 plus years is this recognition of how prevalent, how common postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety are in all women. Obviously, having a bad outcome is a major risk factor for that. But even with good outcomes, good outcomes. it's very common. And we now, and many people now, formally screen every patient who comes in postpartum uh, with you know, the validated screen about you know, questions sure. related to their, to their mood and their behavior and to see if it's you know, normal or if there are any red flags. Red flags don't mean that someone has postpartum depression. It does not mean that someone needs treatment, but it means we need to look Acknowledge further. Acknowledge it, right? Yeah. That we want to actually look a little yeah. closer. And so I think we're, we're doing a much better job at identifying women who have it. And also when people call in we're just more attuned to that, I think, now than we used to be. With mental health, there's been a greater awareness in general about mental health, and postpartum women in particular are at increased risk, and it's a really important time. And I know a lot of pediatricians have incorporated into their practice because the moms are coming to their Correct. office several times over the first month. They see them within the first yeah. couple of days. And so within that first day or two-day period, I remember the pediatrician even asking me, who's a dear friend, you know, how are you feeling? And I said, great. You know, I felt fine. But then it creeps in the sleep deprivation and the inability to put a meal together and you're not eating so well and you feel isolated. And little by little, it just breastfeeding. If you attempt this breastfeeding thing that we we so strive and we encourage all our moms to do, that itself is enough to make you cry on a daily basis, breastfeeding. You know, it's hard at the beginning. And so you go to the pediatrician and they ask you the right questions. And then you know, you come to the doctor's office and whether you had a C-section and you're exhausted or a vaginal delivery, even on the best delivery, you realize that it's it's quite overwhelming. It really is. Right. And it's hard to know because, you know, having a baby for most people is going to be, number one, the most physically taxing, number two, the most emotionally stressful, and number three, the most confusing, particularly if it's, you know, your first or second time in your life. And so, and you're sleep deprived. And you're sleep deprived. And so- Everyone sort of has difficulty with that to some degree, and to to be able to differentiate between sort of what's normal, expected, expected, yeah, expected right. difficulties and expected frustrations or moods versus something that's really problematic, potentially dangerous, and maybe requires treatment. You know, it takes some skill and takes mostly takes someone actually caring and asking and delving into it. And so that's a huge goal of the postpartum visit. Yeah. 
I mean, everything we discuss is, you know, enough reason to come. And we haven't even mentioned physical recovery yet, which is also another aspect just to make sure that they're well after delivery. What kind of physical examination would you be doing to check after delivery for healing and recovery? So anytime that a patient always asks, like, do I really need to come? Like I had the easiest, you know, delivery. I always said yes. And, and I think ACOG in general, our organization always says that every woman should be coming in at least once within that 12 week period. They, you know, we want to see you. And I think the first thing that we do is we always take a blood pressure and we take a weight. We see how your blood pressure looks because some patients can have blood pressure issues that develop after pregnancy. Some patients have medical conditions that obviously that can affect their blood pressure in pregnancy and afterwards. So we always take a blood pressure. We always get them on a scale and there's either a smile or not a smile based upon (laughs) when you step on that scale. But There's an appropriate amount of weight gain that we look for in pregnancy. And then usually within a six-month period, we expect patients to try to lose, it could take up to a year, but to lose what they've gained in pregnancy. And that's realistic. Patients want to jump on that scale and see that they've lost everything they gained, and that's completely unrealistic. But we weigh them. And that way, that becomes part of the discussion and part of what we review at the postpartum visit. Then we have them get changed. And I, I do an exam from head to toe. I really do. I check everyone's thyroid at their postpartum visit. I do a full breast exam. Women who are breastfeeding, Eating, obviously are at increased risk for mastitis, which is obviously an inflammation or an infection of the breast. So I always check their breasts. And women have a real risk for breast cancer regardless of their age. So I always look for any lumps or bumps that may be an issue. I'm always feeling for the size of the uterus because once you deliver little by little, week by week, that uterus should start to shrink in size and go back to eventually the size that it was before they had a kitty. So we're always checking an internal exam. And then you're looking to see if they had any lacerations, tears, or cuts with their vaginal delivery or for the uh, C-section, how their incision looks. So it's a pretty comprehensive exam. It takes a few minutes. Then they get changed. And then we just do a nice sit down in the office and we kind of chat and see how they're feeling. Right. And, and like we were saying before, there are some situations where we need to do those things earlier, like women who had high blood pressure during pregnancy or after delivery preeclampsia, we usually will either have them checking their blood pressures at home and checking in with us on a, you know, daily or every other day basis, or we'll bring them to the office one or two weeks later. We don't expect them to be as healed physically, but we need to make sure their blood pressure is okay. Maybe do some blood work and whatnot. And then, so they're sort of there. And at the same time, frequently, you know, it's an opportunity to do general health maintenance. Like you mentioned, breast exam, if they're due for a pap smear, that would be a time you could do it. Uh, if they're due for a mammogram and maybe they put it off right, because the they were pregnant. Right, that's the looking forward and that's the yeah. looking backwards. And so, so I, yeah, because it's, it's also, it's a visit and frequently, you know, you may not see someone after the postpartum visit and it's hard to come back to the doctor. And so if there's things that just need to get addressed in general. Right, make it easy for them. Yeah, like it's it hard time. with a new baby to get back in for a visit. In general, we always see our routine gynecology patients once a year. And the timing of the postpartum visits kind of like, a little bit off from where their yearly checkup is. So if we can kind of consolidate the visit and do the PAP at that time, we absolutely do. If a patient is due for a mammogram, we'll get them set up for those things that they need to be scheduled for. The looking forward part and the looking back for medical conditions, let's say a patient was a diabetic in pregnancy, what kind of tests do we have to do to screen to make sure that they're not a setup for postpartum diabetes or that they won't have that increased risk for diabetes in the future? We order those tests. If a patient had high blood pressure, well, that's that's a risk factor for life. So we make sure, obviously, if they need to see a cardiologist or if they need a regular checkup with their primary care doctor. And then if they have thoughts, and I always ask the patient, like, all right, you you have this beautiful baby. Not that I want to give you another baby too quickly, but what are your thoughts on birth control and what are your thoughts on getting pregnant again? Because that gives me an idea of timing wise where the patient's head is at. And ideally, I love to give a patient the the idea that they should take a little bit of a break before they try to get pregnant again. And there's a lot of good data that supports not getting pregnant too quickly, both for risk for preterm birth and size of babies and medical conditions, et cetera. But so I try to get them set up to not get pregnant too quickly. And then if they did have a complication or if they did have a poor outcome in the pregnancy, try to get them set up for either a consultation with you or one of the high-risk doctors to talk about what what can be done differently so that they have a different outcome in the future and get those appointments set up. Right. And there's so many important things you mentioned there. And I think the first that a lot of people don't realize is how, and this is also something we've learned a lot more about in the past, you know, five, 10 years is the things that happen to women in pregnancy are often a window for their health in the future. Correct. Think of it like, you know, like a stress test. 
you know, you get on a, you get on a treadmill and there's EKG changes. You're like, okay, right. you're at risk for having you're problems later. So if someone gets pregnant and their blood pressure goes up at the end, they get preeclampsia or they have diabetes at the end. Those things both go away after delivery and you don't have them anymore. But what we've learned over the years is that women who had one of these things in their lifetime do have an Correct. increased, increased risk, risk of getting either high blood pressure, heart disease, or diabetes based on what they had. And some of that is from overlapping risk factors. I mean, the risk factors for diabetes of pregnancy are the same as the risk factors you know, for diabetes of life, but some of it's beyond that. And maybe it's sort of like pregnancy you know, presents the, the body, the physiology with a, a new situation, new situation. And you see how the right. body responds. And so, and I discuss that with women all the time as part of my counseling for diabetes and preeclampsia. And I remind them during pregnancy and after, remember that you have this puts you at increased risk in life. Usually there's nothing to do about it. As you said, we do screen and make sure they don't have diabetes, you know, two months after delivery Correct. and they don't have high blood pressure. But I tell them, put it on your list, right? When you see a doctor and they say, do you have any medical, right? Do you have any medical problems? They say, well, I have asthma and otherwise I'm fine. But when I was pregnant, I had diabetes. I didn't need insulin. I didn't. I had high blood pressure. I needed medicine. I didn't. And any good primary care doctor or internal medicine you know, physician will know, okay, this means I need to screen her more frequently for these conditions. And so don't forget what happened in pregnancy. And that's a critical thing. And obviously, once yeah. again, yeah. because I think for many women who are young and healthy, we're the only doctors who they right. see for a great, great portion of their life up until the age of 40, sometimes even 50. And so they come to us and they may have this, you know, complication or, or thing that pops up in their pregnancy, whether it is preeclampsia or gestational diabetes. And then really, it's part of our healthcare maintenance. And we are primary care doctors to most of these women to let them to say, you know what? okay, I want to test you at six weeks, let's say for the diabetes test, but I wouldn't mind you going to a primary care doctor and getting a screening test or an EKG or whatever it is just for cardiac issues or diabetes in the future, because many times these are the opening in the window to something else that can happen in the future. Right. And again, it could be 10, 20, 30 years, years in the down the future. line. Correct. And so someone who's, you know, let's say 50 and she sees a doctor, you know, the first time in four years and she can say, yeah, when I was 30, I preeclampsia and all my pregnancies, they'll know that that means something. Uh, so it's important to remember that. And obviously what you're talking about also is complications related to pregnancy itself, like preterm birth, for example, you know, or, you know, how the baby was growing or, you know, maybe a particular concern on ultrasound or a birth defect. There are chances that that could happen again in a future pregnancy. And what's so important is planning for the future pregnancy before someone gets pregnant, because a lot of these things need to be addressed before pregnancy. Sometimes they don't. But again, like you said, it's a good time to think about what happened. And before your next baby, sometime before, let's regroup so we can decide if there's any more testing we need to do or anything else we need to talk about before you decide to get pregnant. Right. Because if, if this turned out to be an unexpected, more difficult pregnancy than we all anticipated, what went from simple to something complicated, they had preterm birth, they ended up with a difficult C-section, how to make them feel comfortable going forward, how to make them feel comfortable in their next pregnancy, how to make us do our job even better than we could have done in the future. And kind of that consultation or that visit, we plot out a plan for the future and a plan and then tell them when would be appropriate, how much time they need to recover. Do they need to see specialists, patients with seizure disorders, taking medications? I mean, there's so many different things, but having them make the right doctor's appointment so that they can optimize their own health because the health of the mother will directly impact, obviously, the success of a pregnancy. And so together, we kind of put this whole team approach. And sometimes, you know, they, they don't need much. But if they do, it's best to do it ahead of time. Right. And so in terms of the more looking to the more immediate future, how do you counsel women about things like nursing for breastfeeding? Obviously, it's something that you're we're talking about at the postpartum visit. You know, are you breastfeeding or not breastfeeding? How's it going? And how, do, how does that conversation normally go? So I... I would certainly say the conversation for most of us as OBs, the conversations had in the pregnancy itself, like what are your thoughts going forward? You know, at some of the visits, maybe at the third trimester, are you thinking of breastfeeding or you're not thinking about breastfeeding? And I think how we channel that that dialogue to encourage them to know that breastfeeding is the preferred modality for so many good reasons. So I, we try to set them up for either a breastfeeding class, if ideally we can, because there's some really good studies that show if they take a class ahead of time, they have better success with breastfeeding at the t after, after delivery. Once they deliver, 
the hospital that we work at happens to have a really wonderful, it's a breastfeeding friendly hospital and a program. They have lactation consultants are there. So we kind of get them plugged in with the nurses and lactation consultants. We give them the resources to call them at the time that they're discharged from the hospital. But then at the visit, you know, it's a very real, like, how is your breastfeeding going? And I usually start it assuming that they're breastfeeding because that should be where the dialogue's at. And sometimes it just doesn't work having tried breastfeeding both kids. One was really a lovely child and the other one was not so lovely, (laughs) um, which sums up life in general. But, um, you know, giving them the resources to call lactation consultant if they haven't had the opportunity, sit down with them and figure out what, what seems to be the struggle and the challenge and then encouraging them. I think a lot of times women just need to know that there's actually this club that exists, that breastfeeding is hard. It's, you know, I think people feel lonely, they feel isolated and they feel like a failure if it doesn't look like a, a Hallmark you know, card. And really it's, it's not scheduled. It's usually the baby demanding it. And there's a lot of tears that come from it, but I usually tell them that they can do it. Vast majority of women will have success. And if they can't, that's okay too. Yeah. Like, right. You yeah. need to know that failing is okay. Like right. not doing something perfectly is actually the vast majority of the cases. So I usually, there's usually a hug involved at some point <laughs> um, and a box of tissues, but right. Usually I tell them that each one of us has had difficulty and if it just doesn't work, the most important is really for mom to be happy and the baby to get nutrition. And however that comes in the end is really what matters. Right. I mean, obviously this deserves its own, you know, oh, like 12, 12, itself, 12, right? 12 part do, podcast. Exactly. Yeah. You you could could do, do. yeah. Just, just a podcast on breastfeeding, but no, I totally agree. And, you know, there, there's so much data on it and, you know, the, the health benefits, you know, are, are, it's hard to prove that there's Correct. health benefits. These are very difficult studies to do, but they seem to be there. And they're Supportive. modest, right? They're, the health benefits are modest. The The main benefit seems to be just the idea of the bonding, right? If you're if you're breastfeeding, you're holding your baby, your skin to skin touch. There's that, you know, that it's, and it's very important for the mother. It's important for the baby. So there is a big value in that. And ultimately, if it doesn't work, and someone can't breastfeed, I always reassure them, your baby's still going to be fine. It's the same conversation yeah. I have. You ultimately ideally wanted a vaginal delivery. That's yeah. probably <laughs> where the patients are going mentally. Right. You ideally would like to breastfeed. And if you end up with a C-section, you still are a success, right? right. If, that, if that's the way that you deliver. And the same thing happens with breastfeeding. Your goal ultimately when you start out this process would be to breastfeed. And in the end, which probably was my generation, you know, I, my mom was not successful with breastfeeding and you I think I great. turned out okay. You know, right. like <laughs> I, there was a success story there as well. If you can't, or it's difficult to breastfeed or it just doesn't happen for you, the most important to decrease the risk of postpartum depression is to find happiness and bonding with your baby. Right. And I think that clearly should be the message for all right. of us as providers is a happy mom is a happy baby and that's a success. That really is. And right. so I try to give them whatever pearls of wisdom I have to try to help them with breastfeeding and get them into those appointments. But in the end, growing chubby baby is really the best. Right. And again, yeah, for some women, it's also logistically, you know, it's sometimes it's very difficult for women who are going back to work to figure it out. I mean, this country has some difficulties with that and it's improving, but we're not where we need to be. But that's another the, podcast yeah. in itself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, with, you know, with, with, you know, supporting and helping women who are, you know, breastfeeding, hopefully we'll continue to get better. But for many, they're just in a situation where it's not better yet. And it's, it's just too difficult and okay. You so know, it's, okay. It'll, it's, it's, it's not okay that it's difficult, but if it's difficult, it's okay that they can't. And also, you know, moving forward, you're talking about contraception and birth control. And a lot of that is, like you said, what is their, either their thoughts on, are they going to have more kids, how they want to space it. Sometimes we recommend certain spacing, like you said, particularly after C-sections or certain complications. Ultimately, it probably doesn't make a huge difference for most people medically when they get pregnant. I don't think there's a lot of women clamoring to get pregnant the first few months after they have a baby. So, you know, maybe there are a few, but most don't typically the conversations, whether they're going to be on contraception for six months, six a months, year, year, two, two years, years, something right, like, right. Or, or forever and something like that. And again, there's a lot of options. There's options for women who are nursing, who are not nursing, you know, safe, reliable methods. And then how about returning to activities in terms of, let's say, exercise or work or sex? How do How do you discuss that with women? I think at the time that we're rounding and seeing the patients at the hospital after their delivery, 
we usually are cluing them in when they need to come for their postpartum visit. And like we talked about, routinely, it's about six weeks after delivery. And usually when we're rounding at the hospital, we're giving them a little heads up, if not at the visit before that they deliver, that in general, we're telling them to just take it easy for about six weeks till their postpartum visit. So preferably nothing, no vaginal intercourse, nothing in the vagina, no heavy activity or exercise for that six week period. And that's, you know, pretty much a blanket statement because there's different repairs, there's different tears, there's different recoveries that are involved in all of the individual patients. But we usually tell them no sex, no exercise for about six weeks. Right. For people, most people are fine with that. Certainly most women are fine with not having sex for six weeks after delivery, if not six months, six years, but certainly six weeks. In terms of exercise, most women are generally fine with that. They're like, I'm not planning on doing anything the next six weeks anyways. For those that are more motivated to exercise, either just because they want to start losing weight quicker or just for mental health or just whatever it is, there really isn't like a big risk to doing it. And what I tell women is whatever you're doing, if it's not hurting, you're not damaging yourself. So someone had a vaginal delivery and three weeks later, they're like, I feel normal. And they, you know, they're able to start, you know, jogging again. Fine. You know, great. Do it. It's totally fine. It's safe. It's healthy. God bless. After a C-section, generally takes longer because there's more pain. But the same thing, I'll say, all right, start with a brisk walk. And if that doesn't hurt, part of it depends upon how active you were in pregnancy, right? Yeah. Like, so if you're somebody who actually has been working out throughout the entire pregnancy and you're somebody who's fairly active in life, you also probably will lend yourself to have a better recovery for an easier delivery. So if you had an easy delivery, you're going to feel great afterwards and you're going to be more motivated to work out. So for those patients, once again, that's an individualized conversation. But if you're somebody who's been active, you feel good and you had a, a, a very decent delivery. I say the same thing. You could slowly start to work up to how you feel. If you're having any pain, you should stop. If you're having any difficulty with shortness of breath, then pull back a little bit. But in general, a lot of exercise makes people happy. And it's definitely that mood elevator that balances out that difficult time in the postpartum period. So I think exercise is one of those endorphin boosters that patients should definitely look forward to do. But in general, we say about six weeks. So when they come into the six-week visit, in addition to all the other things that we've kind of talked about, and we talk about getting them back into their regular life, which includes sex with their partner and exercise, we kind of talk about how to go about it. And it's it's a incremental increase, essentially. Right. And I think that, as you said, sort of the general rule is, you know, no exercise for six weeks. But pretty much if you feel like you're someone who can or should be, you know, just talk about it with your doctor. And, and pretty much all of us say, oh, yeah, you know, and, and there's obviously many, many, many people who can and should be starting earlier. That's just sort of the sort of the base that we start with. And again, it's, it's usually okay. I know after our fourth was born. My wife was jogging two weeks later. She had, you know, she felt great. She was an active woman. And she also is someone who working out as a part of her lifestyle. So if she is excited to go back and especially if you can find someone to even watch the kids to get out, I think it gives patients that boost that they need. They really feel normal again. Right. I mean, if someone had a, what I tell people is if someone had a C-section, generally after about two weeks, they'll feel maybe like 75% of themselves. And most people at that rate are not ready to do anything too major. And to get to 100%, it usually takes two months. That last 10, 20% lingers. People are surprised. They, you know, they sort of, they're not in pain. They feel well, but there's five, six weeks out. They're like, I just don't feel feel right. right. You know, and that's normal for a C section. For vaginal delivery, it's generally shortened. Like they'll typically feel, you know, 75 or 80% of themselves. After a week or right. two, also and especially the second child, yeah. third child, with Depends each child, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or if you know, or if they tear less, you know, yeah. and they have different different birth, different experiences. Right. But in general, I think the first baby is a much slower recovery for a vaginal delivery than necessarily the second or the third, on average, yeah. for most people. Absolutely. I would say because they know what to expect. They get their help set up a little differently and they kind of are, are motivated to get back to where they want to be quicker. Whereas the first time mom. It it's a whole new world. I mean, it's it's a lot of change, and they yeah. they really didn't know how challenging either the process could be or the recovery in that six week period. It's tough, right? Yeah, I mean, the first baby's hard again for many reasons. It's usually a longer labor, longer pushing, bigger tear, and a bigger shock to the life because it's sort of a total change. You know, Mike Silverstein used to always say, "It'd be great if you could have your second baby before your first baby." <laughs> That's great. Like, It'd be so much easier so much for easier. everyone. Right. So, but that, first. but, but that definitely, you know, that's all true. And I think another thing is with postpartum care is women need to remember that even though you go home from the hospital and your postpartum visit isn't scheduled for six weeks, we're still taking care of you in that time. And 
it's not like you have to wait to six weeks to, if you have an issue, if you have a problem, you have a concern, you know, call, come to the office, probably about, I don't know, 10% or 20% of women need to have a visit or something between when they go home and the scheduled six week visit. And that's fine. And, you know, we just don't want to schedule it so that, you know, to annoy people and inconvenience that. But certainly it's an important time. And if you're having trouble, reach out. And if you're not, that's great. We'll right. see I you think, at the six-week visit. I think when we, once again, when we see the patients that first day after delivery and that second day, and on average for a vaginal delivery, patients are staying about two days. For a C-section, you add a couple of days onto that. So they usually stay three or four days. Usually by the fourth day, they're out of the hospital. And usually for most by the third even. And during that time period, we always tell the patients, just because you go home, just like you said, doesn't mean that you can't call us. Like right. it, there, that dialogue exists. So if you think that something seems unusual, you should call us. And then most of the things can be answered over the phone. And very few times, you know, will we bring you back into the office to either check something out. And we'd rather you call than to stay at home. And if something's wrong, we wouldn't know about it. I really like what you said at the beginning, the idea of thinking of the postpartum visit as looking at the past, looking at the present, looking at the future for the pregnancy. I think it's a really good way to sort of put it in context. And this was great. I learned a lot from this and I'm sure our listeners did too. So Steph Lamb, thank you so much for coming on again. You're I love it. again the I rock honestly. star, so you're going to come on all the time. Have a wonderful day. Thank you too. Bye everybody. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman Podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N. Com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.